Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles and yeah, Golu coming up in the next 60 minutes. It's been called a cash cow in dejection. The vast deposits of solid minerals across Nigeria, a gold mine that could help the country achieve its long desired economic breakthrough, but which regrettably remains largely untapped. But now, as Nigeria attempts once again to promote its non oil economic development through the mining sector, we ask why has the solid mineral sector failed to become a driver of the Nigerian economy and the country's diversification agenda? We'll speak to the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adebite, in a moment. Now, Nigeria's earth is rich with minerals, but most are not being properly exploited, except by rogue diggers and illegal miners, mostly. Multinational companies used to mine everything from coal to iron ore, limestone to gold, until the Nigerian government nationalized the mining industry in 1972. So today, there are few mining companies operating in Nigeria at all. But now the government recognizes there is a problem, and the country has put legislation in place to protect the claims of registered miners. But for the illegal miners, the expense and complexity of getting a mining license, as well as their mistrust of the government, is preventing them from applying. So as Nigeria attempts for the umpteenth time to promote its non-oil economic development through the mining sector, we ask, why has the mining sector failed to become a driver of the Nigerian economy and the country's diversification agenda? Well, in a moment, we'll speak to the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development as the Buhari administration expresses its commitment to the resuscitation and effective operation of its solid mineral sector. When this administration came on board, they put a lot of attention on uh, mining and have put a lot, a lot of money into it as well. And we begin to see uh, increments on that. There's a lot of money that comes in from mining, which we are now trying to uh, insist that should be credited to mining. But Nigeria lost focus of mining when we got oil and gas, and then we moved away. Because when, when the colonials were here, uh, they relied on mining. Nigeria was quoted copiously uh, on the London Metal Exchange. Uh, we were the largest exporter of Columbia at, at one point. Uh, we were exporting coal, we were exporting tin to the world. And of course, Nigeria was uh, quoted on, like I said, on the exchange. But when, with the advent of oil and gas, we shifted focus away from mining. But now that oil and gas, you know, fossil fuel is on its way out, everybody is talking climate change and all that, the focus is now back on mining. And the potential in mining actually uh, can surpass what we have in oil and gas. Well, that's the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development architect, Lami Lake, on Debite, speaking uh, some time ago on uh, the morning show here on Arise News. And I'm delighted to say that the minister is with me in the studio. Thank you ever so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. First of all, give us a sense of the rich potential inherent in Nigeria's solid mineral deposits. I understand they're so varied that if concerted attention is focused on developing the sector, it could infinitely be more profitable than crude oil in this country. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, to date, Nigeria has established, I said to date because it's a matter of exploration, 44 minerals in Nigeria, valuable minerals. And the beauty of it is it's spread all over the country. Every state of this country has one mineral or two, including the FCT air. And there are instances where some states have about six, seven minerals that could be derived from there. So the potential is huge. But you need to focus and put money into it. Mm. So there's a, every likelihood that, look, if we unless this properly, it could surpass oil and gas. So what kinds of um, minerals are we talking about? Precious metals, industrial minerals, um, gemstones, all sorts. Uh, if you want to be particular, we've got gold, we got coal, bitumen, um, columbite. Iron ore, all, all the rest I, of Iron ore is there. Uh, 
we have all these new uh, rare heart minerals like lithium, cobalt, mm. so, so it's very just there. We're very, we're very blessed because most countries have two, three, four minerals. But Nigeria, as I said, like at the last count is 44. So we're really, really blessed. Right. Now, for years, I mean, that, that sector was left to fester, if you like, in the hands of illiterates and illegal rogue miners, as well as some sort of um, errant foreigners um, who extracted minerals and took away the proceeds without paying anything to the Nigerian government. Have you now woken up from that slumber? Well, <laughs> what ha in your intro, you mentioned it. And of course, that's exactly uh, what really happened. Uh, with, the f with the advent of oil and gas in the 58, 60, focus started shifting away. In fact, the infrastructure in the oil and gas industry was built from mining, the proceeds from mining. But the moment we shifted focus into oil and gas, you know, price of oil just skyrocketed and all that. So focus went away. But the death knell was actually in 1972, the indigenization decree. Mm. So all the big companies left and mining sort of like went into doldrums. Now, for a long time, it's been, okay, we need to diversify the economy and all that. And it's become cliche. Everybody says it, but nobody does anything about it until President Muhammad Buhari came uh, 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 to office. So sometime in, in 2017, that's when serious attention was actually paid because uh, it gave what he called the extra budgetary uh, allocation to the sector. The budget we get on a yearly basis will not do anything in mining. You know, it's just scratching the surface. We barely pay salaries and do some overhead. But in 2017, the president granted uh, the sector uh, a 30 billion fund which, of course, changed the game totally. And that's when people started taking us seriously. Because right. with that kind of, uh, of sum, extra budgetary, we were able to do proper exploration. You say 30 billion naira. 30 billion naira. Right, OK. That was 2017. And with that, you know, it launched out into that stratosphere. Mm. Now, people now consider us. Because initially, when you go out there and tell people Nigeria is a man, uh, we've got minerals. No, Nigeria is known for oil and gas, not for minerals. Mm. But with that, we dedicated about 50% of that money, about 15 billion naira of that money, to exploration. You know, and we started exploration with the right complement of people. You know, you've got competent people who are believed. Anything they put their signature on is believed all over the mining mm -hmm. world. We contracted those people. Uh, they stayed with us. We chose five strategic minerals, and we did a lot of exploration on that. We did data from that uh, exercise. It, that, uh, that exercise is actually called NIMEP, National Integrated Mineral Exploration Project. We took down road shoes, and everybody started paying attention. Oh, you got this, you got this. Of course, with the signature of the competent people that are believed in the world, and everybody wants to come to Nigeria. All of a sudden, Nigeria is now the destination to go to uh, for all those minerals. What, what I find astonishing, Minister, is that Nigeria has always had a fully-fledged, fully-staffed and operational federal ministry in charge of the development of the solid mineral sector. What has prevented that ministry from doing its job for so many years? I mean, why has there been no proactive commitment for decades and such unbelievable neglect of a sector that potentially could transform this country? Well, like I told you, it's lack of attention. You know, it was well, their, you've made the it, point it, it that was lack of attention, but, but why the lack of attention? That's well, what I don't understand. Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. Because, you see, it, it, it was just lip service. Let's diversify. We did not really say, look, look into what we can diversify with. And that will tell you the kind of metamorphosis the, 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 the ministry had gone to. Mm. It used to be Ministry of uh, uh, Mines and Power, uh, Solid Minerals. It's got different names. It's going to, it, at, at times, an appendage to another sector. It's merged with another. Eventually, it's, it's now called Mines and Steel Development. And that tells you that, look, everybody was now, past administration had only paid lip service to it until President Mamari Buhari come, uh, came into office and said, look, yes, let's do this right. Right. And that has changed the game. Okay. I, I know you've mentioned a number of things, but just for the, for clarity, I mean, the current administration 
of the Buhari government, of which you are a part, has made solid mineral, minerals one of its priority sectors, hasn't it? Yes. And presumably you did that from when President Buhari came into office in 2015. It wasn't an afterthought, like, oh, well, w let's look around and see what we can do. I mean, that was part of his agenda. Yeah. What have you achieved since 2015? A lot. Uh, let me first correct the impression. I only joined the president in 2019. It, but you're associated with the government. Oh, oh yes. So um, you, you're going to have to take responsibility oh, oh, for yes, your I, Oh, yes. Yes. Right. Something I'm glad to do because, I mean, it's all uh, positive. You know, right. uh, President Buhari came on in 2015 and then, of course, a lot of work was done. And it was at that time, considerable effort was made. The stakeholders, people from the academia, from the industry, the miners themselves, everybody came together and they designed a roadmap where Nigeria wants to be in the next 10 years. Mm. And that roadmap is uh, a roadmap for mining, 2015, 2025. And that sort of put us like, look, what are the immediate steps? What are the intermediates, you know, midterm, and then the long-term view, mm. where we want to be, and what we needed to do to be in those places. That was done, and it came out in 2015. They sat down, did all of that. And like I said, the president put the funding forward in 2017, you know, extra budgetary, and that is everything. So when I came into office, uh, it was not like starting from scratch. Mm. I made a roadmap uh, that was well on its way. I came in 2019. It was four years down the line already. We just, with the present realities, we just did some tinkering and then we ran with it. And that's, uh, that, it's been a good story so far. So I, I'm, I mean, I'm glad to, to take the can for from 2015 because sure. it's a good story. But well, I, mean, I have to give kudos to my predecessor. I was going to say Kaya well. Defaye. Kaya Defaye yeah. was there. Yeah. Was I mean, there. he's been commended by a lot of people, to be fair, internationally. Yeah. And that, as you say, has smoothed the path for you. Yeah. Um, now, I understand that you, the ministry, has identified over 40 different solid minerals. You mentioned that earlier. Um, solid mineral deposits across Nigeria that are pretty much untapped. I mean, is that it? Is it 40 or are there many 44, more? I said. I you mean, see, 44, right. Yeah, that's, you see, minerals about discovery. Right. You know, so we said so far, we've discovered 44. Right. Uh, that are uh, marketable. Yes, that are marketable. Right. That's what we've discovered now. I'll give you an instance. You see, we were doing this, I was talking about the NIME project and said, look, we, we chose five strategic uh, minerals and said, that's what that many could afford to do. Five, I don't know, right. 44. Now, so the, those are for priority development. Yes, that's like priority development. Right, okay. You know, and that's like gold, coal, iron ore, bitumen. Mm. Uh, this, this is what we do. But now, in the process, like the, the person that was looking for bearite, the mm. bearite is the fifth one, you find an associated mineral along the line, something we are not even looking for. You find, oh, we've got lithium. Lithium is the mineral of the future. Lithium is, yes. uh, is absolutely crucial. Crucial. Electric I mean, vehicles. Everything to do with electric vehicles, computers, and all that sort and of I thing. And I just got that. So uh, that's what I'm saying. I, it's an interesting thing. Because mm. if you don't do the exploration, you won't know what is there. Absolutely. It's on the ground. So you need to do exploration. So, so far, counting is 44. We could discover more. Right. Well, the big question, obviously, is beyond the, the talk and the hope when is it actually going to translate into something? I'll ask you to hold your thoughts because we've got to take a break, but we'll continue this chat. Very interesting. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adebite. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. My guest today has spent the last year or so in one of Nigeria's biggest untapped sectors, solid minerals. For nearly a decade, architect Olami Lekon Adebite was the Commissioner for Works and Infrastructure in Nigeria's southwest Ogun State, playing a key role in the construction of roads, bridges and other projects. Well, now he's Minister of Mines and Steel Development in the government of President Buhari, a government that came to power five years ago on a promise to clean up, reform and modernize the country's solid minerals and mining sector, undermined by corruption, neglect and an over-reliance on crude oil. 
Now that neglect was brought into sharp focus once again when oil prices slumped recently and when Nigeria suffered a recession in 2016. And as the country's economy struggles to emerge from that prolonged hangover, it's become ineluctably clear that it can only do so through effective diversification that must include the solid mineral sector. The question is, does the Buhari government have what it takes to transform the country's ailing solid mineral sector into an economic powerhouse? In gold reserve of over 200 million ounces, most of which have not been exploited developing sustainable programs that will catalyze increased investment in the extraction and refining of gold source from mines in Nigeria is indeed vital. This initiative will also support our job creation efforts, particularly for artisanal miners, by providing them with a guaranteed offtake by the Central Bank of Nigeria. That's the Nigerian president there, uh, Mohamedou Buhari, and the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development architect, Olami Lekon Adebite, is still with me in the studio. Thank you ever so much for staying with us. Um, can you really fully develop the solid mineral sector in Nigeria without foreign investment and expertise? Not really. We do need that foreign investment. Um, with, right now, Nigerian's mineral sector, the mining sector, is dominated by artisanal miners. Uh, the artisanal miners got their role to play. You know, they like the frontiers people. You know, they, they give you direction and where things are, native intelligence, all that. But just that's just what they are. And besides, it provides employment for our people, so we can't discount them. But for us to go to the big league, we know the big names there, the majors, the the, the mining majors. You, you know, the Rio Tinto the BHPs, we need those ones with Glencore to mm -hmm. come into Nigeria and mine. These are the people who can do mining at depths. Uh, I was in a mine in South Africa about four kilometers down, you know, where they were mining diamonds. These are the kind of miners we need in Nigeria. And that's why I, I spoke about President Buhari putting money where the mouth is. You see, because it's with the data that's acquired from such exploration that we can go out and attract these people. And we're beginning to get their attention. Even for COVID, a lot of people have been here by now, you know, scrambling because uh, I, I was in South Africa in February and in, in March I was in, uh, I was in Canada, Toronto, the PDAC. And a lot of people are beginning to pay attention to Nigeria as a mining country mm. because the data we were presenting were very interesting, signed by competent people. So I, I think we're, we're on the right track. Because, I mean, you know, listening to you talk, um, and, you know, obviously the, the impression that we're getting is that Nigeria is much more user-friendly today than it was a decade ago. Uh, and the evidence, you know, it, it, you're saying is, is from the meetings you've had with a lot of companies and so on. But a lot of those companies say, I mean, when they talk to the media, um, that contrary to that evidence that you're talking about, that... Um, they're reluctant to come into Nigeria and they're blaming hostile policies in this country. Well, uh, I'm not sure where that comes from. In other from. words, that the business environment, even though it's improved, it's still not where they'd like it to be. And there's still that fear of what might happen, the same sort of thing that happened in 1972. Well, I think we'll probably we, uh, this country can go back to 1972. 1972 was very arbitrary. It was a military thing. And I think, I think even people who did that probably will have regrets much later. It, it wasn't called for. Uh, but be that as me, that's on the past. We need to focus on the future. What, what's important, and the vibes I'm getting, is different from this. People want to come to Nigeria because, for instance, in mining, we've got all the right policy in place. Mm. You know, fiscal of uh, uh, policy all this is very very interesting and this is what they come in you know there's tax waiver for people uh, will waive uh, import duties on mining equipment you've got all, all of that you, 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 there's up to 95 percent capital allowance there's so many things and these are the things people are looking for and also we get we we allow 100 percent ownership Mm. of foreign investors you know unlike some other mining countries where it's not allowed nigeria allows that so long as you follow our rules you pay your royalty and all that it's beginning to yield results you know we've got a foreign company 
Toy Explorations is a Canadian company quoted on Toronto Stock Exchange. They are in Oshun State mining gold there. Uh, just before the COVID, as soon as I came back from Canada, I was in I was in Malaysia to turn the sword, you know. And this, despite the COVID nineteen pandemic, they're still building their mines, and they are still a bit slowed down, but they're on track. They were supposed to start exporting gold from that mines uh, first quarter of next year. They should tell their focus maybe to the beginning of second quarter because of, of the COVID mm. has slowed them down. But that's one company. Yeah, that's one company. But you see, that, 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 that's it. It, that's what everybody's waiting for, you know. It's like, who's, who's going to jump into the pond, you right. know? So Tracking somebody's got to go there yeah, first. Somebody's gonna, so, Toss done it for us. And people are waiting for the success story. Right. So, so can, can we now undeniably, Minister, incontestably say that the global mining community is now paying attention to the renaissance of the mining sector that you talk about? And if so, beyond paying attention to it, is their interest increasing? Definitely. I can say that without any equivocably. People are paying attention. People are actually making inquiries. I mean, when but do you have any agreements with any companies to come in beyond the, the gold miners, the, the people mining gold in Oshun State that you talked about? Have you actually oh, I've had a concluded a, agreements? Well, not concluded. People. Like I right. said, uh, the last uh, international road show I was at was the PDAC in Canada. And there were a lot of interest. People were asking how to get the visa. They wanted to come to Nigeria and all that. And of course, the pandemic setting. So that has been a slowdown there. Mm. But people are willing to come, to come and see for themselves. And you see, we've got this. The good thing about it is that you see, everybody's waiting. Okay, we're saying, like, just like you said, the uh, policy, the regime, the environment, is it okay? Now somebody's braved it and coming, and that's uh, this uh, Canadian company. And by the time they start exporting uh, gold next year, it becomes a success story. And everybody wants to rush it. Mm. And that's what happens. You, you look for you know, the litmus test. And, uh, and that's what we've got. And okay. they're doing very well. Nigerian government is supporting them all the way. Well, as you said, no country's economy, and um, you, know, you can't be blamed for that, no country's economy has been left untouched by COVID-19, and Nigeria is no exception. What are the next steps that you are taking to grow the solid minerals industry in Nigeria in the face of the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic? First thing, we need to deal locally. And that's the point, like, because a, a lot of our people are affected by this mm. uh, pandemic. Like I told you, the, the sector is dominated by artisanal miners now. And of course, they're badly affected. Um, and, uh, this uh, recovery thing, the government has voted about 2.3 trillion you know, to try the economy so that we don't go into uh, depression. And we've got a sizable chunk of that money. And what we're focusing on is actually our people. The, the, the artisanal miners. Mm. There are so many programs post COVID that we're doing for them, from palliatives to even extension services, training. But m m more importantly, is to bring them back. You're, you're basically yeah. trying to integrate them into the formal sector. Is, is that yeah. what you're doing? Well, we, we, that, that has been on for a while. Right. Because you see, uh, we do not criminalize them, uh, they, they are like uh, quasi legal. What we do is we, we, we go there, you know, and for my, bring them together. One, you know who they are. So we take biometrics and all that. And then we try and aggregate them, form them into cooperatives. When they're in cooperatives, they're easier to deal with. We'll give them equipment. We'll give them funding. Mm. We'll give them training. Okay. And, that, and that, that's been yielding okay. result. But Minister, this part, oh, sorry. Sorry, Minister, I don't mean to interrupt you. We'll talk with you some more, but I've got to take a break. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adebite. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. 
So can Nigeria, Africa's biggest economy, go beyond its addiction to oil and embrace its rich solid mineral sector? Well, according to many analysts, both in and out of Nigeria, this is the country's biggest hope. The periodic global slump in oil prices has hit Nigeria hard, where oil exports make up more than 70% of government revenues. Meanwhile, vast deposits of solid minerals lie untapped across the country. Well, the Buhari administration says it spotted this discrepancy and is launching an ambitious scheme to exploit everything from gold to iron ore. It's hoped that this will help to diversify Nigeria's oil-dependent economy, which has plunged in and out of recession because of fluctuating global oil prices. But are there bumps in the road? And if so, what are they? The Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adebite, is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you. And of course, these days, Minister, in addition to worrying about revamping the solid mineral sector, you also have to ensure that whatever you're doing is environmentally friendly and that you are not compromising issues of good governance, don't you? Yeah, that's very important to us. Um, uh, the good thing is that we learned a few lessons from the oil and gas industry. Uh, you know, where uh, at the advent of oil and gas in the 50s, particular attention was not paid to uh, environment and the people. So in, in mining today is the first thing. You cannot mine anywhere without what we call a, a community consent. The people you're going to mine on the land, in their neighborhood, in their community, must consent to you coming there. You have to convince them. So if you have like 10 communities over the area, if you have 20 communities, you must have an agreement individually mm. with all these communities. So it's the first thing. And uh, after the consent, then we can grant you a license to mine. But beyond that, there's another thing called community agreement. After you have the license, you must now have this community agreement. This uh, part of this agreement, apart from the fact that you will have, of course, submitted an environmental impact and uh, are you going to put the place right uh, again? That's the company coming in. Yes, the company coming right. in. All those are before you can start mining. Mm. You know, remediation plan must be part of your environmental impact uh, uh, report. Now, you have to agree with the community, what you call community agreement. This is like um, a graduated sort of, um, if, if you like, gratification for those people. They must benefit. Yes, Not absolutely. like what happened. So. Mm. It, it, uh, as a symbol of goodwill, you could say, look, okay, I'm coming. I'm going to grade a few roads for you. But, you see, the, that community agreement graduates as you start your mining, as you begin to make profit. Mm. You go from ordinary just grading the roads. Oh, you promise them el electricity. You're going to bring that into this community. You're going to give scholarships. I'm going to build a town hall. You know, some people make monetary uh, promises. On, the, uh, on an annual basis, we give this to the community hall or the community association mm. to benefit the whole area. So these are graduated benefits that must come to the community. We uh, stand as umpires for this and make sure that the community's expectations are moderated, especially in the early stages, and at the same time, the company does not exploit the community. Once this is signed, it's codified and it must be followed. The company must do what it has promised, what mm. is in the community agreement as of time, because uh, at the initial stage, they're going to put a lot of capital up front, but then as we begin to mine the minerals, the money will start flowing, and then they must be able to do what they have promised. So it, these are lessons we've learned from the uh, oil and gas industry. So we're The not devastation. Yes, the devastation. We are not the Niger falling, Delta. We're not falling into the same trap again. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good start. But is it fair to say that in spite of everything you and your predecessor in the ministry may have done in the last five years, Nigeria remains over-reliant on oil, and that's a dangerous place to be given the ravages of COVID-19 and given the fact that oil prices have you know, been slumping more frequently these days? Well, um... Nigeria's been reliant on oil and gas. And that's another lesson we're learning. Don't forget, this is also a natural mineral. So we, sh we should not, at the same time, be over-reliant on it. Absolutely. But then, that's, rather, that's a good point. Yes, rather, mm. you see, is the development this could bring for us. And that is why, uh, I don't know where we're going to get to it, but you see, we've started what we call a downstream policy. We need to develop our industry with those minerals. These are finite minerals. It could take Absolutely. you the next 50, 100 years before you exhaust it. And I'm glad but you're then, saying Yes, that. but in, the, in those years, mm. you must develop the economy. 
you must transform into an industrial economy. Mm. So it's not just for you, like well, the mistakes in the, in the oil industry. We export crude oil and then we get refined petroleum. Why can't we develop our own industry? Uh, the, well, and that's the, a question we should be asking you. You're, you're well, in government. <laughs> I mean, I well, mean, you see, government is a continuum, and I don't want to pass. Yeah, but, but let, let I me don't say want to pass this. judgment. Right. But uh, the, some of the lessons we learn from the mistakes of the past is that we don't want that to happen mm. in the in the mining industry. So we, we, we've got this uh, downstream policy. You don't export raw oil. You must do some beneficiation mm. locally. That is develop it. Look, for instance, we get limestone. All the, if I almost. So there's a value chain attached. There's a value to chain attached to it. Right. Lime is used in water purification mm. by all states' water corporation and all that. Why can't we just develop lime from that and then use it? The industry, we import bayrights into this country. We've got a lot of bayrights. Why don't we develop our own bayrights? Mm. Save Nigeria about $300 million per annum that we used to import bayrights and use that. And of course, also export. These are things we can develop that will create employment. Retain the value in Nigeria, uh, uh, and um, Nigeria can only be better for in, it. In fairness, you're, you're, you're putting it very articulately, but I mean, some people will say we've heard it all before. <laughs> now, when President Buhari won the Nigerian presidency five years ago, it seemed like Nigeria had turned the corner. I mean, there'd been the first ever peaceful democratic transition. It brought the promise of less corruption, better governance, and major economic reform. How would you say that is going? I mean, has the Buhari government, your government, been able to transform this country into a modern economy? Are things better economically today than they were five years ago? Well, things are better if you look at certain parameters. Some people would disagree with that. But you see, uh, it's unfortunate that, you see, as soon as President Mohamed Bari came in, in, in 2015, oil price fell from about 140 at its height, fell as low as $20 per barrel. You see, this was not his doing. So things become very uh, difficult for us. We went into recession. But you see, with some very quick action and all that, we were able to come out of that recession very shortly. As we're getting out of that, to begin to enjoy the, uh, the dividends, then the pandemic set in as well. But I'm telling you that the fundamentals of the economy is being put in place. And I've, I've, I've had this discussion with a few people. You appreciate this administration of President Muhammad Dubari in 10, 15, 20 years' time. This is somebody who, I mean, changed from the Nigerian persona. He has inherited so many projects. The standard is that I want to start my own. That's the ego. That's the baggage I was talking about. When I got into cabinet, and you know, we we're discussing a particular project in cabinet, you, you hear a road 20 was ordered in 2003. That's the road President Mohamed Bari wants to finish. The second Niger Bridge, he wants to finish it. He didn't start it. He didn't say, Oh, I'm going to start my own all over again so it can be a glory to my name. So these are the fundamentals. We are putting the infrastructure in place for this country to grow. It's doing the well. It didn't start it. It started with Dr. Basanjo. He could have said, Oh, I'm going to start my own all over. You know, this being glorious thing. And all that. But the man is doing the right thing. Diligently, he's quiet. He's not a noise maker. And I said, look, 10, 15 years down the, uh, the line, people that are around will say, oh, this man really did this for us. Because then, those things will have been yielding and then would transform Nigeria. Right. And that's where we're going. But I mean, it's it's not, you cannot say it immediately. Yeah, uh, but the fact is that you've been, the government has been in office for five years. Oh, yes. No it doubt. It took that government more than two years to come up with its blueprint for transforming Nigeria. It took that government almost seven months to appoint its cabinet. I mean, these are, this is all valuable time lost. If all this transformation that you're talking about, and let's not harp on COVID-19, because that's a pretty recent thing that just happened yeah. a few months ago, why is the unemployment rate as high as 30%? Why is the poverty rate growing and above 70% and worsening in Nigeria today? Let me tell you this. You said valuable time lost. Because, you see, when uh, the president came into office in 2015, things were really bad. And Nigeria was actually functioning on corruption money. Sincerely. The moment that was blocked, the reality set in. People have to leave by the sweat of their brow. And that's what was in the situation. We needed to go down, you know, to the world, to the worst situation before we could rise. 
things will get worse before they get better. Because number one, the first thing that was stopped was the ostentatious display of ill-gotten wealth. Mm. That immediately ceased. You know, before then, I mean, there are examples there without mentioning name. In Abuja, yeah, there was a city that was just being built on the way to the airport there. And, you know, before Bori came in, the first block was oversubscribed. The moment the man came in, that project stopped. Mm. You know why? Because the money being used was ill-gotten wealth. And this is the man who came here and was going to frown at that. And of course, even people who had that wealth could not flaunt it again. And of course, because of that, and that is what was actually keeping Nigeria economy afloat. It was this ill, Ill And it had a limit. The elasticity was bound to break anyway. So coming in and stopping that, this flow of illegal, ill-gotten wealth, of course, took us. We went down, yes. And then, of course, like I said, the recession came in. That was nobody's fault. Because you ask yourself, when oil was selling for $140 per barrel, what did you achieve with it? Then this man came in, oil went as low as $20. I don't think, since President Buhari has been there, he's never gone beyond $70 a barrel. So, you ask yourself, that we had government in this country. When oil was selling at all-time high, this was at the time the hand was hot and you should have struck. But this man, despite the low resources and all that, he said, yeah, just borrowing and borrowing. Yes, the president would say, look, yes, let's borrow for infrastructure because this is what will make us grow. We will not borrow to pay salaries. We will not borrow for this. But let's borrow for infrastructure because those are the things that are missing in Nigeria. And I think this government is on the right track. It might take a while. And like I said, it's something that you begin to appreciate much, much later where after this government will have left office. Well, we've got about uh, two and a half minutes or so before we've got to take another break. But let's return to our discussion about the solid mineral sector, which is your area. The problem is that even if you're able to revamp that sector, I think you touched on this earlier, Nigeria would still be dependent almost entirely on natural resources rather than human resources. And we know from many examples that any country that relies on natural rather than human resources is more likely to be underdeveloped or at least less developed. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. You see, we have lessons to learn from what had happened in the past. We can use this as a catapult, you know? It's a basis for growth. And we're not going to rely that, okay, we just sit back, let's mine it, the gold, gold is selling at all-time high now, at $2,100 mm. an ounce, and then we can make so, 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 so much from it, you know, raking billions of dollars from our gold. No, we shouldn't do that. We should use that to develop the human capacity. Yeah, but you're not prioritizing human development. Of course you? we are. That's I mean, what I was telling you. That's, I, I, I mentioned my, the downstream policy. What's the downstream policy? It's actually the human capacity to transform the raw ore into a finished product. Yeah, but the emphasis is still on natural resources yes, extraction. But then you are developing the industry, and those industries will not go away. You are, you are developing expertise. The expertise will not go anywhere. Knowledge acquired cannot be taken from you. And that is it. Because now uh, we're we developing the human resource to be able to get us to that. Well, I mean, because I'm thinking of companies like Apple, for example, that makes iPhones. I mean, computers and all the rest of them. Apple is now worth over $2 trillion. That's one company. Whereas Nigeria's GDP, a country of 200 million people, is $448 billion. I mean, is there a lesson there? Because policies and the infrastructure that will unleash and support innovation and enterprise, I mean, those are things that are provided by the human brain. But, but you know, President Mobile was the first to change uh, the Ministry of Communication to Digital Economy. And that has been developed as it were. Okay, let me ask you to, I'll come back to this point, but I've got to take a break now. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development architect Olami Lekon at Debite. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise Interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, my guest today, architect Olami Lekon Adebite, is the Minister of Mines and Steel Development in the government of President Buhari. And the Ajokuta Steel Plant, one of Africa's most disastrous development projects, falls under his ministry. There are a few places in Nigeria which give such a clear insight into the years of mismanagement as the massive Ajokuta Steel Works in the center of the country. Although 
period, construction began in the late 70s and has dragged on at enormous cost for decades. Ajayakuta has never produced a single piece of steel. Nobody will ever know how much money has been diverted from this ill-fated project into private pockets. A skeleton staff forlornly patrols a plant that was meant to employ 10,000 workers. Ajayakuta's technology is now outdated and it is more economical for Nigeria to import steel than to keep the plant going. Goats and cattle can often be seen wandering around the rusting machinery of the steel rolling mill. And the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development architect Olami Lekon Adebite is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you. Do you agree that Ajokuta has got to be one of Africa's most disastrous development projects? I must first say that was the most unkind statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not here to be kind. I'm uh, here about, to, to get uh, to the about facts. About Ajakuta. That's to say it mildly. Um, because really, that's, uh, there's some mistakes in there, in that statement. Ajakuta actually produced still, at the point, it was produced still from imported billets. Uh, so it actually produced still uh, at some point in time. And uh, the technology is not obsolete. Uh, even the biggest steel producers in the world today still use uh, the blast furnace technology. If you want to produce steel on a large scale, you've got to use the blast furnace. And that's what we have in Ajakuta. The beauty of it is that you see it's a brand new blast furnace that's never been used. You mean you've, you've put in a brand new, because I've been to Ajakuta a number What I'm of saying times. is the blast furnace installed has never been used, so right. it's, still, it's still new. I mean, it's never been well, used. Well, if you're but sitting there, there for as long as it's been sitting there... Yeah. I would question whether it's even able to function at all. Oh, but it does. I mean, I didn't know whether you would know anything it's about three, four weeks ago. The senior leadership came visiting to Ajakuta. Yes, I heard about that. Yes, and we did a dry run for them, you know, to show that things are working in Ajakuta. Yes, a few things that you may need to update in Ajakuta, especially the electricals. That's all. But for the mechanical parts, everything has been oiled regularly, been serviced. The parts are moving very well. Right. Yes, but of course, you know, electrical, they have been modernization, you know, from the analog to the digital to the PLC. Yeah, you may need to change when it comes to electrical. But the, the, the plant itself, the mechanical part of it, is still intact. So the why has it been sitting there yes, for so, so long and doing absolutely nothing? Well, I may not be able to answer for past administration. This is the administration I joined. Well, I'm sure you look at the historical. I yes, that's what I'm saying. You would assess uh, how you uh, got to uh, where uh, you uh, are. If I want to tell you, I, I, first time I went into Ajakuta and I said, look, yeah, some people have been actually cruel to this country. You know, we've done a lot of disservice to this country. Because if you look at this plan and the potential, where it will take us to, somebody should have actually attacked this project head on and finished it mm. and let it produce. There were times when Nigeria had the money. And I wonder why people do just not face it, like what President Buhari is doing today. We're doing the right thing, we're on the right track, and I pray that before the end of this administration, Ajakuta will fulfill its right. place. Right, so, so what are you planning to do with it? Is it still viable? It's very viable. Right, so That's what are you, what are you going are to do with money. it? Right. We want to resuscitate Ajakuta on a build or play transfer basis. Are you selling it? Is it going no, to still be sold. owned by the government? It's been held by the government, 100%. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, if I just go down the history grad, uh, uh, briefly, sometime yeah, last please. year, there was a Russian-African summit mm. in, uh, in Sochi, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Russia. And uh, that on, on the sideline of the summit, the mm -hmm. president had a bilateral with President Putin. October 23, 24, last year precisely. And I was at that bilateral, sat beside the president. One of the requests we made to President Putin was, because they were the original builders mm. under Soviet the Union. The Russians, with, yes. yes. the Russians and the Ukrainians yeah. under the Soviet Union built Ajakuta in the first place. So we went back to them and said, look, we want you to come and complete Ajakuta for us. Government to government basis. Take out all these charlatans. The commercial thing we tried in the past. We've tried concession to two different people. It never worked. So let's do a government to government thing. And President Putin accepted that. And of course, right now, we've got pledge funds. The African Bank has pledged $1 billion. The Russian Export Center, akin to what you, the American uh, Exim Bank, they've pledged $450 million. We have $1.5 billion for the association of Jakarta and Niomko, which of course will supply the iron hall. Mm. And that process has actually started. So we are on the right track. Uh, even for the COVID, we were supposed to have technical audit from March for three months. The technology will have finished, will have had the report. In fact, we will have had boots on ground now with the resuscitation. And the beauty of this is that it's a build operate transfer thing. 
Ajakuta, we did a business case which was satisfactory to uh, the, the people bringing the money, you know, the lenders. So Ajakuta is going to pay for itself without burdening Nigerian economy. So these people will come in, resuscitate, and manage for a number of years. Mm. From the profit deriving from Ajakuta, pay off the loans, make some profit, and then the ownership reverts back to Nigeria. That is the part we are on now, and it's a good thing, and it's moving very well. And, and how long is this, I mean, never, beyond COVID, how long do you expect this you see, at the time take we before Nigeria it. itself actually starts making money from it? And use oh, it. before it goes back to Nigeria. Yeah. I, ca I can't tell that because, you see, uh, but for it to start working and making money to pay back its loan, it's about two and a half years. Right. Yeah. So it will start paying its loan. But you see, so within the life of this administration. By the grace of God. Right. Okay. But Nigeria never seems to learn lessons, does it? I mean, each successive government comes in. There is oil boom, and then they don't apply the money judiciously, and then there is a slump, and then there are difficulties that come with the slump, but they never see it as an opportunity to get serious, do they? But you're saying that finally this government is doing that. Yes. That's what this government is doing. This government has looked, and that's why I say lessons learned. You know, even in the mining sector, we've mm. looked at the failures of the oil and gas industry. You spoke about the environment. We prevented that with policies. You can't do mining without having an environmental policy in place, including remediation. Immediately you finish your mining, it takes some time, maybe 25 years. You must put the ground back on a useful state for agriculture. Right. So that's part of the remediation plan, and we enforce that. You have community agreements. So the people must actually benefit. You can't live in abject poverty, right. like in the Niger Delta, and you see all well, the money I, I they spend to... in Lagos and in Abuja. Yes. This people must also benefit. I, as I have to say that I really honestly wish that everything you're saying is going to come to pass. It's already happening because, in Elisha. We have because, a foreign company there. No, they I have, understand that. And you, you that mentioned already. that. I mean, I, I, because, because, I mean, people, a lot of Nigerians are still, they're just not convinced that you've got the right reformative policies for the economy. I mean, one thing the president identified with, we're, we're almost out of time, when he came in and subsequently was trying to maintain against so many odds a strong currency. Many people in Nigeria and abroad thought that was crazy because he was essentially undermining the confidence of foreign investors who simply didn't believe that it was sustainable. And those people have been proven right. So now, I mean, if you go to change pounds or whatever, it's you know, over 600 naira to one pound. I mean, that was a policy mistake, wasn't it? And it gets people concerned about his other reformative policies. Sincerely, I'm not a financial expert, but I'll tell you this. Uh, we've been beset by a few setbacks. I tell you about the depression. Nigeria has always been reliant on oil and gas. You know, what we made from crude oil. That has been a major revenue earner. And of course, uh, immediately this man came into office, the price fell and it's never gone up again. We had oil selling for 140. And you, you, you and I sp spoke about President OBJ's time. He created what he called excess crude oil. We've got about 20 seconds before okay. we have to end the program. But sincerely, I think this president is on the right track. Yes, a, a, a few bumps along the road. But like I said, it's a legacy. In 20 years' time, people will look back and say, oh, this man has done us very right. Because then we'll be in prosperity. Well, I hope you'll be proven right. Uh, architect Olami Lekon Adebite, the Nigerian Minister of Mines and Steel Development, absolutely delighted to have had you here. Thank you very nice much. Nice one, indeed. Charles. I appreciate this. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.